Welcome to Fashion And with me, Scott Schiavone, Fashion Curator. Just a reminder that you can keep up to date with everything Fashion And by following at Fashion And with Scott Schiavone on Instagram and by hitting that subscribe button. In this episode, we'll be looking at the man who redefined haute couture and dominated post-World War II French fashion. Widely considered by his contemporaries as the master of us all, this is Fashion and Balenciaga, the master of haute couture. If Dior is the Watteau of dressmaking, then Balenciaga is fashion's Picasso. For like the painter, underneath all of his experiments with the modern, Balenciaga has a deep respect for tradition and pure classic line. Cristobal Balenciaga had a reputation as a couturier of uncompromising standards. Balenciaga loved elegance, beauty and above all, women. Beyond his search for purity and restraint, he wished to transform women and to reveal them to themselves, famously saying, A woman has no need to be perfect. To wear my dresses, the dress will do all that for her. A highly skilled pattern cutter and tailor, Balenciaga created his innovative designs, working intently at the construction of each garment dissecting its structure in great detail, seeking out their secrets like a puzzle, endlessly reworking and simplifying until he reached perfection. Fifty years after his death, Cristobal Balenciaga remains a legendary figure in the history of 20th century fashion. In this episode, we'll be exploring Cristobal Balenciaga's life and legacy through five themes. Becoming Balenciaga, a Spaniard in Paris, the House Codes, Master of Us All, and After Balenciaga. Cristobal Balenciaga was perhaps the best known Spanish fashion designer of the 20th century. Cristobal was born in Gateria, Spain, on the 21st of January 1895. His father, José Balenciaga Basurto, was a fisherman, and his mother, Martina Esegueri Embal, a seamstress. His father died when he was a boy, so Cristobal spent the majority of his time with his mother as she worked as a seamstress for the Marchioness de Casa Torres. At the age of 12, Cristobal secured a tailor's apprenticeship in San Sebastián. However, the Marchioness recognised his talent and sent him to be formally trained in Madrid. In 1917, Cristobal Balenciaga opened his first namesake boutique in San Sebastián at No. 2 Cali Vergara. The business was successful from the start and his clientele included Spanish aristocracy and royalty. His early designs reflected the trends of the time. This early coat from the 1920s evokes the lines of the Japanese kimono. In perfect tune with the aesthetics of those years, the wide turn-down collar and the sleeve cuffs were adorned with ermine fur. Cristobal regularly travelled to Paris, where he examined closely the work of other designers, in some cases purchasing their models to disassemble and study in detail. During the 1920s, Cristobal received permission from Jean Lomva to reproduce some of her dresses in Spain, such as this long, loose-fitting dress with no seam at the waist. By October 1927, he had changed his company name to Isa after his mother. Isa soon expanded, opening boutiques in Madrid and Barcelona. The fall of the Spanish monarchy in 1931 was quickly followed by the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War between 1936 and 39. Cristobal left Spain during the Civil War and settled in Paris at the age of 42, where he opened a store at 10 Avenue Georges Sank under the simple moniker Balenciaga. When Balenciaga arrived in Paris in the 1930s, he joined a coterie of European couturiers, including the Italian Elsa Schiaparelli, the British Edward Molyneux, and the Swiss Robert Piguet. In February 1939, the Daily Express ran a story about a young Spaniard who was revolutionising fashion. 
describing how buyers and press were literally fighting to see his couture shows. Throughout his career, Balenciaga celebrated his Spanish heritage. Balenciaga's inspiration came from the bull rings, the flamenco dancers, the fishermen in their boots and loose blouses, the glories of the church and the cool of the cloisters and monasteries. He took their colours, their cuts, then festooned them to his own taste. Black on black using fast to jet beads, velvet and corded bands, black passementary with pale blue or yellow reminiscent of matador costumes, tiered flamenco style skirts and layers of mantilla light black lace adorning evening gowns. Balenciaga especially adored the colours, volumes and forms of the fabrics depicted in the paintings of Spanish masters such as Velázquez, El Greco, Zurbarán and Goya. Once established in Paris, Balenciaga was to command an international audience that would visit the French capital even during the Nazi occupation of France during World War II. Whereas other designers fled Paris during the Nazi occupation, Balenciaga stayed and since Spain technically remained neutral during the war, he had the advantage of being able to keep his Spanish house Isa in operation. But it was Paris that provided Balenciaga with the ideal environment for his professional development as the greatest couturier. A plethora of dedicated craftspeople who were an essential part of the success of French haute couture meant Paris retained its position as the capital of fashion. Paris contained hundreds of dedicated craftsmen making buttons and flowers and feathers and all the trimmings of luxe which could be found nowhere else. Several years after making the pilgrimage to Paris as a young designer, Balenciaga made Paris his permanent home. By the late 1940s, Balenciaga had emerged as the main rival of the favoured designers of the period, including Jacques Faf, Christian Dior and Gabriel Coco Chanel. Balenciaga did follow the styles of the times as he grew ever more confident and masterful establishing his style and defining his house codes. Balenciaga was a master of tailoring, having trained in Madrid where he learnt the fundamentals, especially British tailoring techniques. His advanced tailoring skills gave him an advantage over other designers. Balenciaga's suits were understated, classically simple and could pass unnoticed in a crowd. Only those in the know would notice the subtle cut and quality of fabric that characterised the Balenciaga style. With Balenciaga, less was always more. By the end of the 1950s, Balenciaga's suits had developed into a number of shapes, some with long bodies, others with short bodies, some with fitted jackets and some with bloused backs some with full length sleeves and others with three quarter length sleeves. Their skirts by this time were usually slim fitting and through the 60s lingered below the knee or rose above it according to fashion and to the age of the wearer. For Balenciaga, the whole garment centred entirely around the sleeves. He believed that a sleeve should adhere to the body, be its natural extension and fall without the slightest flaw. It should be supple enough to allow movement but without dragging on the rest of the silhouette. The arm should be able to slide in naturally. He inserted triangular godets into underarms to give the wearer more freedom of movement. This for Balenciaga was both an aesthetic quest for comfort and an endlessly repeated technical challenge. At the slightest distortion, he would pick it apart and start all over again moving the fabric with meticulous care, taking out the pins himself to repin elsewhere until the imperfection disappeared. The result was an irrefutable cut and iconic silhouette. <music> Through his evening wear, Balenciaga gave rein to his imagination. A Balenciaga evening gown made the woman who wore it as aloof and inaccessible as a work of art. In his evening wear, Balenciaga selected solid colours such as pale blue, sapphire, lilac, ivory, shocking or salmon pinks, apple greens and of course black to create drama and draw the eye to the gown's architectural shapes. A simple pastel coloured sheath would be worn underneath an elaborate organza coat or jacket entirely covered with brightly coloured ostrich strands or silk blossoms. Textures were added in the form of elaborate beaded or sequined bodices 
encrusted with three-dimensional surface decorations or trims or layers of overlaid lace. The embroidery specialist Maison Lesage produced specially commissioned elaborate fabrics sumptuously embroidered to create rich textures or shapes. However, with Balenciaga, it was always the cut and construction of the gown he intended we notice first. The more streamlined, sculptural and apparently simple it appeared, the better. Beneath its apparent simplicity, each of these little dresses is a masterpiece of haute couture. Examine them closely and you will discover the subtlety and originality of the cut. The silhouettes created by Balenciaga set new trends and expressed a radically different relationship between the body and the garment. The fluid lines of his clothes conveyed a fundamental classicism and combined elegance and comfort in a perfect harmony of proportions. In the late 1940s, Parisian haute couture was divided into two camps. The first was the season-by-season -season lines of Dior, which moulded women's bodies into strange geometric shapes defined by ever-changing corsetry. The second, epitomised by Chanel and Balenciaga, developed lines gradually to create classical, timeless models that were easy to wear and moved with the body. Because Balenciaga did not introduce a new line each season, the press had to invent their own suitably evocative names. He pioneered the midi line and the tunic line, the sac chemise, the empire line and the baby doll line. Throughout these designs, quite a clear progression is evident in the development of one style to the next. Each one represented a departure from the traditional emphasis on the waist. In fact, the tunic and the sack eradicated the waist altogether. Fastenings on his clothes never disrupted the purity of form and line and were often so simple the wearer could simply slip it over their head. Even his structural evening dresses tended to fasten with a simple corset-like belt and unlike Dior's formal dresses did not involve the complexities of multiple buttons, loops, hooks and eyes. Balenciaga's lines were also very practical. The tunic, chemise and empire styles were simple and flattering to both thin and curvaceous women as they avoided the waist altogether. Throughout the 1960s, Balenciaga perfected his technique and purity of form. His innovative designs used new materials, both synthetics and natural, and he was particularly known for his mastery of the bias cut in ensembles of linen and crepe. Balenciaga had a discerning eye for fabrics. He liked bold materials, heavy cloths, new fabrics, reliefs that caught the eye, the transparency of lace, ornate embroideries, striped fabrics, tweed, fai, taffeta and moire. Not surprisingly, Balenciaga liked fabrics that mixed colour boldly or in which colours changed according to the way the light fell on them. Fabrics were the initial inspiration for Balenciaga's collections and the availability of rare fabrics in France was one of the joys of establishing a couture house in Paris. Balenciaga also worked with textile designers and manufacturers across Europe to develop new types and mixes of fabrics. His collaboration with them was a mark of approval that merited publicity and helped to spread their name. Balenciaga believed that the couturier had to be virtually scientific in the choice of his colours. His sense of colour was described as kinetic, causing the eye to move and vibrate by creating unusual colour combinations. Balenciaga's range of greys, blacks and browns were legendary. These subtle combinations probably derived from his Spanish background and referenced the great variety of greys and blues seen in the Cantabrian Sea. The regional dress of Spain attracted Balenciaga's attention, especially the red and brown and black stripes of much Basque and Castilian costume. He was also influenced by the pinks and purples of ecclesiastical vestments. But above all, Balenciaga was best known for his use of black. Balenciaga's black is so black that it hits you like a blow. Thick Spanish black, almost velvety, a night without stars, which makes the ordinary black almost seem grey. The impact of religion on Balenciaga's work cannot be overestimated. In fact, religion was a fundamental part of his life. He was inspired by actual clerical dress and vestments he saw in church, 
which contributed to his feeling for the mass of fabrics and their sculptural possibilities. Liturgical vestments were usually cut by tailors, made up and, where appropriate, embroidered by nuns or professional craftspeople whose needlework skills were renowned for their high quality. His late collections in particular owed a debt to liturgical vestments. The piercing of a full circle or semicircle from narrow fabric was often a feature of Balenciaga's ball gowns. His wedding dresses of the late 1960s are positively ascetic in their austere simplicity, cutting his garments in very simple forms based on circles, semicircles and tunics. Like the robes of priests and clergymen, shapes could be made from gathering or belting rather than darting and seeming. Balenciaga's clothing was simplistic in appearance but impossible to imitate due to his rigorous construction and mastery of execution. Even when Christian Dior made his triumphal entrance onto the international fashion scene in 1947, nothing could dim the popularity and fame of Balenciaga. Dior himself referred to Balenciaga as the master of us all. Even Chanel, whom Balenciaga quarrelled with, acknowledged his mastery, saying, Balenciaga alone is couturier in the truest sense of the word. Only he is capable of cutting material, assembling a creation and sewing it by hand. The others are simply fashion designers. Balenciaga refused to show his collections at the same time as the other couturiers, which resulted in more rather than less press coverage. The major magazines such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar would send their journalists back to Paris specially to see his shows. He avoided licensing and the allure of the mass market and concentrated instead on maintaining his reputation as a couturier of the utmost luxury and elegance. Despite his mastery and reputation, Balenciaga never joined France's prestigious governing body, the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. Balenciaga believed that a fashionable woman could be elegant only if she knew herself well enough to trust and patronise a single dressmaker. As a result, the couturier established an extremely wealthy international private clientele and demanded astronomically high prices. Balenciaga dictated fashion to the point that other designers copied him and the world's richest women were prepared to pay top prices for his clothes. The life which supported couture is finished. Real couture is a luxury, which is just impossible to do anymore. The world had changed a great deal since Balenciaga started his career. Experiencing the societal changes of the 60s, Balenciaga saw that the time for luxury and elegance was past. Balenciaga presented his last collection in 1968. The Evening Standard wrote, Balenciaga decides to quit and fashion will never be the same again. His clients were extremely loyal and it is rumoured that when his fashion house closed, Mona von Bismarck shut herself in her room for three days straight. The couturier retired to his house in Igueldo near San Sebastián in Spain, where he died in 1972. On the day of his death, Women's Wear Daily ran the headline, The King is Dead. Ironically, the House of Balenciaga survives today because of the switch from couture to ready-to-wear, most notably by French designer Nicolas Gesquier, who in 1997 was appointed creative director of Balenciaga, after his Dutch predecessor, Josephus Thimister, was fired following a highly unsuccessful show. During his 15-year tenure, Gesquier's vision turned Balenciaga into a critically acclaimed fashion house. His biggest commercial success was the motorcycle bag, or lariat bag, with braided handles and dangling zipper pulls. In November 2012, Gesquier announced his departure from Balenciaga, and Asian-American designer Alexander Wang was named as his successor. As creative director, Wang would oversee the women's and men's ready-to-wear and accessories lines. His debut Autumn Winter 2013 Balenciaga collection was shown in February 2013 at the Balenciaga Salons in Paris at 10 Avenue Georges Sand. However, after only six collections, parent company Kering issued a press release announcing that Wang was leaving Balenciaga by mutual consent. 
Demna Vasalia replaced Wang in 2015, bringing with him the love for street style that made his own brand Vetement so successful. Vasalia combines pop culture references and sportswear detailing with classic tailoring and elegant cuts that are instantly embraced by fashion fans and celebrities alike. Under Vasalia, Balenciaga announced its return to haute couture for the first time in over 50 years, basically since Cristobal Balenciaga shut the brand. On the 7th of July 2021, Balenciaga staged its first haute couture show at 10 Avenue George Sank. The show melded Balenciaga's legendary way with tailoring with Vasalia's modern approach to fashion and streetwise aesthetics. Vasalia's Balenciaga has challenged our assumptions about celebrity, luxury, popular culture and even reality itself. Vasalia is a populist interested in subverting fashion. What he has done with each of his projects is dismantle brick by brick the false boundary between the vernacular and the luxurious. Personally, sometimes, I think he's just taken the mic. The genius of Cristobal Balenciaga has proved over the years to be utterly timeless. He lived for his work, devoting his entire career to the quest for a perfect elegance which combined simplicity and mastery of technique with sometimes eccentric and abstract daring. Cristobal Balenciaga had a reputation as a couturier of uncompromising standards. He loved elegance, beauty and above all, women. Beyond his search for purity and restraint, he wished to transform women and to reveal them to themselves. A highly skilled pattern cutter and tailor, Balenciaga created his innovative designs working intently at the construction of each garment. Fifty years after his death, Cristobal Balenciaga still remains an icon in the history of 20th century fashion. Well, that's it for Fashion and Balenciaga, the master of haute couture. I'll see you next time, but before you go, don't forget to subscribe to Fashion and with me, Scott Schiavone, Fashion Curator.